Tonight in our lesson, I want to begin with something small, and I want to work towards something that is greater. The year was 1980, it was February, and there were 12 amateur hockey players who were about to take the ice in Lake Placid, New York, to go up against the greatest hockey team in the history of sports, the USSR. Now, about two weeks earlier, they had already played a game. And in that game, the USSR had defeated the good old US of A by a score of 12 to 2 in Madison Square Garden. And everybody probably thought that they knew how this game was going to turn out in Lake Placid, New York. Once again, it would find the USSR victorious over the good old US of A in a score that would be a little bit embarrassing. But that night, they were wrong. You see, that night, the good old U.S. of A. was victorious over the USSR by a score of 4-2. to two. It's oftentimes regarded as one of the greatest upsets in the history of the world. The USSA or the USA went up against the greatest hockey team in the world, the baddest hockey team in all the sport, and they defeated them in a surprising upset. You could say that the runt defeated the bully. You could say that the Cinderella team defeated the best team. You could say that the U.S. of A. hockey team conquered their giant. Yes, it's known as one of the greatest upsets in the history of sports, but it's not the greatest upset of all time. That we find in 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the story of David and Goliath. And you'll remember that story as a young man, a little run. Standing in the valley of Elah, you know in Hebrew, the word Elah literally means tree. The valley of the tree. And David stood in that valley against a man who was as big as a tree. His name was Goliath. He was the meanest bully in the history of the world. He was the grand champion of the Philistines. He was the meanest man that they had. In fact, when King Saul figured out that it was going to be David who was going to go up against Goliath in the valley of Elah, you'll remember what he said in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 33. He said, you are just a youth, but Goliath has been a soldier from his youth. You see, if Goliath were living today, he would be the tallest man in the history of the world, surpassing far beyond the man who holds the world record, whose name was Robert Wadlow, who stood eight feet tall and four inches. He was bigger than Shaq, Yao Ming, and Andre the Giant. But not only would he be the tallest man in the history of the world, he would also be the strongest man in the world. The Bible tells us that his armor alone weighed about 125 pounds. That's not counting the spear that he carried. That was a giant-sized spear made for a giant like Goliath himself that weighed 50 pounds itself. This man was carrying almost 200 pounds in armor. And he was almost nine feet tall. And oh, did he like to talk the talk. In verse 10, you'll remember that he was taunting with that talk, the army of God. He said, come, bring me a man that I may fight with him. If he defeats me, I shall be your servant. But if I defeat him, he shall be my servant. David didn't like that too much. David asked, who is this man who tots the army of God? Oh, that's Goliath. You you don't want to mess with him. Now, he's a pretty mean man. Have you seen him? Have you seen how big he is? These are the type of people that the ten spies were talking about. When they spied out the land, they said, they're like giants and we're like grasshoppers. That's the type of man Goliath is. But David wasn't afraid of him. And how's that story in? David meets this giant face to face in the valley. This giant has on his bronze armor, all close to 200 pounds of it. And all David has is a shepherd's bag with five smooth stones. David talks some talk too. If you read the verses, you'll see that David says, Come to me. And I shall feed your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. You come to me with a spear, a javelin, an armor. 
And I come to you in the name of the Most High God. David took that smooth stone and that shepherd's bag. He put it in a slingshot. He reared it back. And he slung it right into the forehead of that giant. And perhaps it was the loudest crash of victory that rung throughout the ages and generations of the world when David defeated that great giant, Goliath. David conquered his giant. You know, the story of David and Goliath is one of many stories that we find throughout the Bible of great acts of heroism. The Bible, quite frankly, is replete with stories of men and women who accomplished great things, who were willing to put their life on the line for God's name and for God's cause. It's replete with stories of great heroism. These men and women who accomplished great feats of faith. Then there's your story and my story. Have you ever thought about the fact that The times that we live in today are pretty mundane compared to the times that we read of in the Bible. I mean, there's no more literal giants to conquer as did David when he slayed Goliath. There's no more lions to slay as did Benaniah or as did Daniel in the lion's den. There's no more seas to part as did Moses as he was leading the people of God out of the land of Egypt. And since we live in such mundane times... Is it possible for us to achieve these great heroic feats of faith that we read of in the pages of the Bible or are those feats of faith for the times of the past, for history, never to be accomplished again? See, I think we sometimes overlook something about heroism in the Bible. Heroism in the Bible didn't begin with the big things. Heroism in the Bible began with the small things. I mean, we sensationalize these stories of great feats of faith from these men and women that we find within the Bible to the point where we believe that we have to live sensationally if we're going to live heroically. But let me remind you of the words of Jesus, Mark chapter 9, and verse 41, when Jesus talked about what it means to be great in the kingdom and what it means to do an act of heroism when he said, For whosoever gives a cup of water of drink in my name, the one who belongs to me, know this, by no means shall he lose his reward. Jesus says that heroism, the great feats of faith, they begin with the small things, even something as small as giving a drink of water to one who belongs to me. You see, as you go throughout the Bible, we're going to find that the great things, always began with the small things. The stories of great heroism that we find within the Bible where men and women conquered these great giants of all time, they began with the little things. And as we look at the little things that they overcame in their lives to finally vanquish those great giants of all time, perhaps you'll find some words of application in your own life perhaps with some giants that you face in your own life. You know, the story of Noah and the ark, it's one of the great feats of faith that we find within the Bible. In Noah, we find one of the great men of the Bible, a man who found grace and favor in the eyes of God, who built a great feat, that being the ark that God had commanded Noah to build. He preached a great message, that being the love of God and the salvation of God that was offered to those who were lost during that time in which Noah lived. And he did great things. He helped save his family. Eight souls by water. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And now there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer or the appeal of a good conscience toward God. Yes, Noah did some great things. But the great things that Noah did, it began with Noah conquering a small giant that we all must conquer. And that is faithfulness. Have you ever thought about how difficult it was for Noah truly to be faithful to the commands in which God had given him? I mean, think about it. Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord because the rest of God's creation 
was sinful. They were unrighteous. And Noah was charged with preaching a message of righteousness, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, to a whole generation that was wicked and perverse and unrighteous. You've got to imagine that that came with some ridicule. That had to come with some insults. That had to come with some hardships. And yes, Noah had the greatest sermon illustration in the history of the world in the ark. But you know people ridiculed him for that. They'd never seen a flood of this magnitude, the one that Noah was preaching. They were thinking, there's no way that God is going to bring this much water on the earth. And you're a fool in building an ark that big. We've never seen a flood that big. But Noah had to overcome that small giant of faithfulness in his life if he was going to achieve great things. It's a giant perhaps that you relate to in your life. Perhaps you're going up against a a giant of faithfulness in your life. Perhaps it's coming from a spouse. Perhaps it's coming from your child. I remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, starting there in verse 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves daughter or son more than me is not worthy of me. And who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus says, if you love your father or your mother more than me, if you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. Now what Jesus isn't saying is this. You shouldn't love your family. Obviously, Jesus knew we should love our family. But what Jesus is saying is, if you love your family more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. For I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And what's the sword that he's referencing? He's talking about the Word of God. You know, the Word of God is truth. But sometimes people don't want to hear truth. And because they don't want to hear truth, they separate themselves from it. They divide themselves from it. And that may even come in the form of your own family. Perhaps you're trying to conquer a giant of faithfulness in your life. Maybe you're really struggling because your child is in a lost spiritual state. And you're thinking in your mind, I just can't be happy if my child is in hell and I'm in heaven. We need to let our children know we'll die for them but we will not go to hell for them. What about your spouse? Maybe your spouse is in a lost spiritual condition and you're thinking, I I just, it's too hard to be a Christian in this house. I, I can't live my life the way that I'm supposed to live it. They make it a hindrance. It's hard for me to be faithful. They're constantly bombarding me with all these things and I'm just ready to, to give up. I remember when Paul said in, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Maybe it was Paul, maybe it was somebody else. Therefore we also, since we're so surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which also ensnares us and endure the race of faithfulness, looking unto the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. I hate to look at them this way, but sometimes our own family can be a weight that we have to lay aside if we're going to run the race of faithfulness. It doesn't mean that you have to hate them. It just means that you have to love God more than you love this world. And I know that's hard. But it's what we're called to do. Maybe you've got to conquer this giant of faithfulness in your life. There might not be any more arcs to build, but I know this. We all must conquer the giant of faithfulness and build our lives around the promises of God. In the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 39, we read a story about a man by the name of Joseph, specifically Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And every single day, Potiphar's wife came to Joseph, and she said to this young, handsome teenage boy, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And every single day, Joseph turned her away. Every single day, Joseph rejected her advances until one day Potiphar's wife just got fed up with it. And so when Joseph ran away from her, she grabbed his garment and she took that garment to the authorities. She said, this man who serves in my husband's house, he abused me. And even though Joseph was completely innocent of all wrongdoing, 
He went to prison for his convictions in Jesus or in God and his faith in God's plan. Joseph had to conquer a giant of trust. Have you ever thought about how difficult it was for Joseph to trust God? I mean, think about it. This man went from riches to rags and back to riches. This man was the favored son of his father. He was given a coat of many colors, but his brothers didn't like that too much. And so one day they threw him in a pit while they ate lunch, trying to figure out what they were going to do with him. Finally, they decided, I'm going to sell him into slavery, and that's what they did. And he went to Egypt, and then they took that coat of many colors back to his father, and they said, he's been killed by a wild animal. Your son, your favored son, is dead. Joseph was sold into slavery. He would be imprisoned. He would spend a lot of time in prison. Most people would have given up on their faith. I'm just not happy. I can't find happy in faith. I'm just going to have to find happy in prosperity, even if that means I have to go against God. But this same man asked the question when it came to the temptation that he was facing from Potiphar's wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph trusted in God in slavery. Joseph trusted in God in prison. Joseph trusted in God when he saved the Egyptian people and his own people. He trusted in God. And that's what laid that great heroism that he would later accomplish in his life. Perhaps the giant that you've got to accomplish in your life, the, the giant that you've got to vanquish is, is sexual immorality. Maybe it's fornication with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Maybe you have a struggle with pornography. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, starting there in verse 27, You heard that it was said of old that you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery within his heart. Maybe that's a giant that you've got to face, that you've got to conquer. There might not be any more Egypt to conquer, but I know this. We've got to conquer a giant of trust in our life. We've got to trust God that he shall deliver us from the sexual immorality that tries to defile us and destroy us. What about Daniel in the lion's den in Daniel chapter 6? I suppose that everyone has enemies... And Daniel had some enemies. His enemies came in the form of governors and satraps. They were looking for something against Daniel, some sort of accusation because they wanted to do away with Daniel. He was growing too powerful. And so finally they found their end. They knew that Daniel prayed three times a day. How often do you pray? And so Daniel was taken and he was thrown into this den of lions. And the king said to him, your God, Daniel, shall deliver you. And so there's Daniel facing these lions face to face. Willing to die for his love of God. But it all started with Daniel willingly conquering a giant of persecution. Yea, and all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. Maybe you struggle with a giant of persecution in your life. Maybe it's family members who are trying to find some sort of accusation against you about the Lord's church. And they're trying to draw you away from the Lord's church back into your old religion where your other family members are. They're questioning what you do. They're questioning what you believe. You're not alone. Jesus knew what you're going through. In John chapter 7 and verse 5, the Bible tells us, For even his brothers did not believe. Jesus knew what it was like to have family members who didn't believe. Maybe it's friends. You know, I think sometimes, we oftentimes regard our enemies as our closest friends. Those who we believe have our best interests at heart, but they don't have our best spiritual interests at heart. They're doing wicked things, unrighteous things, and they want us to go with them. So what are they going to question? Well, they're going to question your righteous deeds. They're going to question your faith. They're going to question your convictions, and they're going to try to draw you away like they've been drawn away. And you've got to conquer this giant of persecution and be willing to remain faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. That reminds me of another man. John the baptizer. Now here's a man who was willing to be faithful 
unto death. In fact, especially in the story of Herod Antipas and Herodias. Now, here's the background of this story. Herod Antipas is married to a woman by the name of Herodias. But Herodias was married to his uncle before she was married to him. In fact, Herod Antipas took his wife away from his uncle. And so John the baptizer comes before them and he makes a claim against Herod Antipas. He says, it's not lawful for you to be married to this woman. Did you notice what he said? It's not lawful for you. He didn't say it's not right for you. He said it's not lawful for you, appealing to the law of God. He said it's not law for you for to be married to this woman. So Herodias didn't like that. Maybe Herodias thought that John the baptizer was a, a threat to the wealth that she had. Maybe John was a threat to the power that she now had. And Herodias didn't like that too much. And so Herodias connived and devised plans until finally she had John the baptizer's head. Perhaps the greatest act of heroism was the fact that John was willing to die for even something like standing for the truth on the subject of adultery. You remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29? We ought to obey God rather than man. Well, maybe the giant in your life is the giant of standing up for the truth. Maybe you struggle with standing up for the truth because maybe you believe that you don't know enough to be able to refute the very false things that you're hearing about the Bible and you just don't know how to tell others about what God's Word says. Maybe you struggle standing up for the truth because you've got a lot of doubts in your mind and you don't really believe that what you believe is truth. Or maybe you're a little bit uncertain about your beliefs. Maybe you're afraid of standing up for the truth because... You just don't want to cause any division. You don't want to cause any separation. I don't want to break any relationships or friendships. And so I'm just going to remain silent. Throughout the Bible, great men were marked by their willingness to speak when others remained silent. We shall not obey we shall not bow down to your idol, O king. If you try to kill us, our God will deliver us. There might not be a Herod Antipas or a Herodias to conquer anymore, but we must conquer the giant of doubt in our lives and stand for the truth because it's only the truth that can free us from our greatest giant. Sin. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. The prophet Zechariah once asked the question, Who despises the day of the small things? By my best estimation, I believe that we like to see what God does with the great things, but oftentimes we overlook what God does with the small things. In fact, that's what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 17, at verse 20, wasn't it? Jesus talking about something small and how something small can lead to something greater. He said in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from here to there and it shall move. Now, I don't know if you know how small a mustard seed is, but what Jesus is referencing is something that is so minute that it's almost not seen. And he says, if you have faith, even that small, you can achieve something great like moving a mountain from side to side. God's greatest acts always begin with the smallest acts of his servants. Jesus was one of God's greatest servants. He once said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You remember what Jesus did in John chapter 6, starting in verse 1? The Bible says that he fed 5,000 people 
Thousands and thousands and thousands of people were fed with leftovers from five loaves of bread and two small fish. He took something so small to demonstrate a greater principle, and that was this. John chapter 6, verse 35. I am the bread of life. What about the widow and her two mites? A mite was the smallest currency in that time. All she had to rename was two mites. And she took those two mites and she deposited them into the box. And Jesus used her example and she, he said that she has given more than all because she gave all that she had. Even though what she had was small, she gave it all. And Jesus used her as an example of small things becoming greater things. I love this one. Andrew's invitation to Simon Peter. It was a small invitation. After we had heard of Jesus, the Bible says in John chapter 1, starting in verse 41, he first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And I love this part. And he brought him to Jesus. All it took was one small invitation to one who would be one of God's greatest preachers, who would accomplish great things in the kingdom. Something small led to something big. You see, the stories of great heroism that we find in the Bible begin with the small things. I suppose that God's not asking us to do great things. He's simply asking us to do the small things and be faithful. And if we prioritize our priorities around His kingdom, He will do great things through our small acts of faithfulness. Here's another quotation from a minor prophet, Haggai. In Haggai 1, verse 2, the Lord said, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord. Now here it is, and work, for I am with you. God says work. If you work, if you do the small things, if you hand somebody a cup of water, if you help someone along their way, if you say a nice word of encouragement, a nice word of kindness, if you let your speech be seasoned with grace, if you allow someone into your home, if you take the Bible and you show someone a verse to teach them the way of Christ, the small things are going to lead to greater things. If you want to be a hero, like what you read of in the Bible, It doesn't begin with the big things. I suppose that we can still do big things today, but it begins with the small things. And God still needs courageous men and women of faith who are willing to be heroes. So here's the challenge. Where's your giant? Look for your giant. Stand up as David stood in the valley of Elah, as Daniel stood in the lion's den, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood as everyone else bowed down to that golden idol, as Stephen stood before the Sanhedrin council, as Peter stood before those on Solomon's portico. Stand up to your giant and conquer it. And by doing small acts of faithfulness, God can do great things amongst His people. If you're here this evening and you want to be a godly hero, it begins by living your life for God. You know, everybody that we read of in the New Testament who did great things, they first obeyed the gospel. I remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11 about 
John the Immerser. Now here was a man who was a great man, and he said, Assuredly I say unto you that among those born of women there has not risen one greater than John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, but he, now here it is, who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John was never a member of the kingdom, but you can be tonight. You could become a New Testament Christian. You could put on Christ in baptism. Galatians 3, verse 27. Have your sins washed away. Acts 22 and a verse 16. And live faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and a verse 10. You can choose to do the small steps that God has left us within His inspired word that will lead to the greatest life that you could ever live. 